Hi everyone, welcome back. It's Blake again with Northwinds Wilderness School. <clears throat> We're gonna start another new segment today, and this is one we've been working on for a while. It uh, it originally was gonna be called Conversations with Atreyu, where uh, once a month Atreyu and I would get together and have a conversation about kind of hard topics that relate to rewilding. And after filming a couple and having sort of some pre-screening done, we decided that we should start this off with a conversation about what is rewilding. Um, you know, on the surface of things, it may seem fairly obvious what the term means, but when you start to dig into it a little bit, you're going to learn very quickly that it's a highly nuanced word. A lot of people have a lot of different feelings about what it means, and a lot of people have really strong feelings about what it means. You know, you've got people all the way from, like completely anti-civilization anarchists all the way to people who want to continue living their modern life but include more nature and more wildness into their completely modern life. I think as we move forward with this segment, we're also going to throw in some other guests. Um, so it won't just be me and Atreyu, there will be other people thrown into the mix as the topics become appropriate. In fact, today... We're going to bring a couple of guests with us to talk about what is rewilding. Um, stick around, we'll see who we've got here. <laughs> All right. Thanks for staying with us. So we're actually today at one of my favorite places. Um, we're back at Rewild University. Um, I'm starting to almost feel like I get to come up here as much as I'd like to. <laughs> Not quite, but we're getting close. Uh, so I've got with me today Kenton. Oh. who's the founder of Rewild University, Atreyu, who hopefully by now you know as my other instructor at Northwinds. And then we've got Dustin, who is uh, also an instructor at Rewild University. So we haven't rehearsed this at all. It might get weird, but we're <laughs> just going to try to hash out a um, consensus, was the word we decided we were going to use, on what rewilding means. Um as a movement or as an idea. <laughs> so, I, I have something. Yeah. This, this is, I feel like, a really strong foundation for what rewilding means for me. Is that you said earlier in that, um, you know, you have somebody that's uh, anarchist, you know, like on this end of the spectrum, and you have somebody that's just trying or to, you know, incorporate some nature philosophy or, or uh, you know, herbs or something into their modern life. Mm -hmm. And so we have this large spectrum of people. And that's the great thing about rewilding is that it actually encompasses a, a large amount of people, whether they want to be, whether they know they're a rewilder or not. If somebody is deciding to maybe eat less fast food and cook some more home cooked meals, then they're on that spectrum. So there, it's, um, you know, maybe that's that they're uh, choosing to buy grass-fed beef or something like that versus the McDonald's McDouble or something like that. So right. the good thing is that this is super inclusive and that anybody and everybody fits on it. The only criteria for that, in my mind, is that it's working to be more harmonious with nature. Harmonious with nature. So, yeah, I think that's a good aspect. And I also agree that it, it has to be a spectrum. You can't say it's this or it's this or it's this. Um, and Peter Michael Bauer, who I don't know if I should be name dropping in this video, but it's, it'll work out. Um, in his book, he says several times that any subject carried to the extreme leads to rewilding, which I think um, what you were just saying reminded me of that because if you take nutrition, if someone is trying to move from McDonald's towards a healthier state, they're moving in the direction of rewilding, whether they know it or not. Mm -hmm. Or if someone is trying to go from couch potato TV watcher to more active and more movement in their lives, they're heading towards rewilding, even if they don't know it. Mm -hmm. um, so I like the inclusiveness angle. I like the spectrum angle. And I feel like this isn't going to be much of a debate because it sounds to me like we're already starting off on the same <laughs> foot. <laughs> I, think there's, I think there's a lot of things in there to get more specific about, though. I mean, yeah, I agree. 
Um, yeah. But in, the inclusion is incredibly important. You don't want to make you don't want to make anybody feel, you know, outside of this. It's um, and uh, I think we've discussed some of these things before. That's uh, that's some of the issues we have with talking about this topic is that it is exclusionary in some ways. And some people might take a really hard stance that excludes, you know, if you're not, I mean, this is, you know, this is probably just my own mental games here, but if you're not, um, you know, living off the land, then you're not a rewilder or you're not rewilding, you know. If you're still buying beef, you know, if you're supporting the animal agriculture, then you're not a, or you know, like it'd be easy to, to create really hard boundaries. Mm -hmm. And even if the even if someone else isn't saying that, which I'm, I'm sure there are, and maybe I'm just saying it, it's that, uh, like, we got the, the first thing is that our own boundaries of of what rewilding is like for ourselves, allow ourselves to feel comfortable at where we are, acceptance of where we are, and we are working towards harmonious actions. Mm -hmm. I'll leave it there. I definitely think there are people out there who have a hard line on what they think rewilding is, but that has never sat right for me. I'm not really, I'm not, I mean, I, my circle is very small. I've not met anybody that's been, you know, like too aggressive about it or anything. So. And, you know, I talked to somebody this other day whose who's, uh, studies is in uh, uh, water ecosystems around the Great Lakes. And I was like, man, that sounds like, you're a rewilder and they're like I never heard of that before so <laughs> um, yeah that's awesome have you guys had experiences with people being hard line on either side I don't really go on to the I haven't had stuff. a I haven't had a personal experience with it but um, I know of people who take more of a, a hard line not only with its definition but with um, inclusion or exclusion um, so, but I have not met anyone in person, but I know it, it is a thing. And that, that's a thing with any kind of philosophy or movement is there are going to be some people who think it's that only certain people belong in it or something. But rewilding is supposed to be, I mean, other people have called it human rewilding to differentiate between what we're talking about here and the process of um, undomesticating like ecosystems or farmland. So if it's human rewilding, the only criteria to me is that it's human. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I suppose that's a valid point to bring up. As far as I know, and if I, any of you have more information, I would be happy to hear it. When the term rewilding first sort of came to be, um, it was in Europe, and they were talking about turning farmland back into wild spaces, about allowing it to go feral. Um, and it became a movement to rewild the land in Europe. And then the, the human rewilding aspect came about later. I do see that a lot. I see rewilding used in the context of European landscapes, oftentimes. Which is part of rewilding, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> to, to me, that would be part of it, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I kind of want to pick your brain, Kenton, because I, I, want to re, I want to revisit this conversation we've had before, because you started the school, Rewild University, you know, I'm just going to say 10 years ago, okay? But you came at it from the more ecological aspect at first, and then you decided at some point that this can be turned into a, uh, a human experience too. I mean, yeah. Now that humans are, ex are separate from the ecology, but you know. No, definitely. Can you tell that story? I think that I mean, looking at that ecology and then looking at our own inner human ecology, it only made sense that is there, is there something there? You know, when we look at the ecosystem, we know it's always changing over time. And our ideas of what is a balanced ecosystem change over time. We can't go back to, well, maybe we can. <laughs> Mammoths and saber tooths and, you know, but that was a very different ecosystem than what we have now, even with, you know, with our apex parameters, which are very much different than. You know, so we have this constantly evolving ecosystem and that's happened in the human animal too through its evolution mm -hmm. and it seemed to me as if I guess my hypothesis was that with civilization something we lost something and we lost access to something so I wouldn't say we lost something intrinsic to us but we lost access to something that was 
the essential humanness of us. And the more our cultures progressed, you know, culture that boxes, that, that everything is built on judgment and on stratification and chopping things apart, that we look out at a forest now and few of us can see the ecology of it. We can maybe see it broken up into its little pieces. If we know nothing about nature, it's just a chaos. Yeah. <laughs> so somehow could we access that? And then through getting to watch people out in the woods, you know, there's only a couple programs that we're doing the length we were doing. So, you know, we were doing 11 months out in the woods and we'd see people have transformations. And it seemed to me that the message from our culture is that the human animal is kind of intrinsically evil. It's, it's a bad creature. We need to have all kinds of laws. Otherwise, we're going to be completely out of control. If we don't have everything boxed just right, it's going to be a disaster. Mm -hmm. But and then you watch people out in nature, freed of a lot of the constraints. And of course, we're doing mental spiritual work to free us of a lot of our own ideas of who we are and who we're supposed to be. And it just seemed like this different creature emerges that's compassionate, that's loving, that's non-judgmental, that's curious. And so to me, that's kind of the, the essence. And for me, it very much starts up here. It's a mental thing, the rewilding. Yeah. We've, you know, in our culture, we have boxed our movement. When you think about natural movement when you were hunters and gatherers, and then when we were farming, and now for a lot of us, you know, yeah. this is our movement. <clears throat> we're on a, you know, in a factory, and whatever it is, it's very, very constrained and narrow. If you think about our diet, you know, 10% of our calories from soy, the average American. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not, you know, add corn and wheat, and what would we be at? So our diet, but in a more subtle realm, and I think to me a more important one, also our inner self. We don't have an idea of who or what we are anymore because that disconnect with the organicness of the world. And we can't even see that because our mind right. now is so into boxing. It just has to box everything up. Yeah. Yeah, we've we've very much, you know, human beings for I'm gonna say six million years have been generalists. You know, we worked with stone tools and we worked with clay and we made baskets and we hunted megafauna and we foraged and we built shelters and we made clothes and we raised children and now we've very much become a specialized species you know we fix computers we play a sport we fix cars we build houses and that's who you are right, right? yeah your job is who you, you are, are. <laughs> yeah. and I, I feel like that extreme special specialization that people have taken on in their lives is part of what's pulled us away from nature because we feel like we don't have time to break the green wall, so to speak, because we're busy, you know, building that house or fixing that car or whatever. Um, which is why um, one of the things that we teach at Northwinds is um, we call it breaking the green wall, and then and we say you break the green wall with the phenomenon of recognition, which I'm sure that every single one of you has experienced this. I know you have, where you look at a forest and it's green and that's all it is. And then you learn how to identify stinging nettle and it's green plus stinging nettle. And then you learn how to identify burdock and it's green plus stinging nettle and burdock. And then you learn how to identify white pine and then it's green plus stinging nettle, burdock and white pine, etc., etc., etc. And I feel like something very simple like learning to recognize what you're looking at in nature instantly helps people feel more connected to it you know it, it takes some of the fear out of it and helps people feel like they actually belong there mm -hmm. which you know we do yeah. belonging <clears throat> like maybe this is my own box but what can, oh like this the, there's like a single word that comes to my mind constantly whenever i you know I, of course, when we're having conversation, it's like, how do I relate to this? So my relation to that is always participation. 
when you guys say these things. It's like um, participating in nature, recognizing things, belong, feel like, to have a sense of belonging, you have to be like participating in something. Mm -hmm. You can like sit over here and then think you belong, right? So um, participation, and there's kind of two maybe ways, this is dichotomy of this is, uh, there's manipulation and particip participation. So we can participate in nature, we can manipulate nature. And for me, rewilding is the idea of working towards participating. And then, and then you know, cleaning that up by making sure it's also harmonious and not, you know, detrimental to, mm -hmm. to the ecosystem, and, you know, over harvesting certain plants or funguses or uh, fungi or, you know, deer or something like that. Um, so there's, there's, there's always like, detail work to be done but it's participation in your in your environment now participation doesn't actually have to be at the scale of you know having 40 acres or something like that and that's that's the only time i can participate is whenever i have the land and i have the the cabin out in the middle of the woods that's when i participate the participation begins when you're at home and you know i lived in an apartment for 10 years or whatever and participation began there whenever i started looking at what do i have available to me yeah, mostly a bunch of LED lights and some and some street signs and right. and roads, but Maybe just over there. <laughs> yes, <Yeah, some dandelion. laughs> a lot of dandelion, a lot of dandelion, a lot of squirrels and rabbits and stuff. Um, bees flying on the retention ponds, but and so I can observe those things, but participate in them. Um, can't take the geese from the from the <laughs> retention pond, but there is that line of forest over there by the railroad track. So I go over there and see what's over there. And maybe I feel better about collecting the dandelion there because maybe it's not being sprayed with glyphosate or something like that. Yeah. Um, so begin looking at your most closest environment and then uh, participating in it. And it, once you actually put yourself out there and, and uh, you know you start recognizing that there's reishi or there's uh, chanterelles or um, you know, it's, I get surprised if I'm like not lion's mane in the middle of a middle of a um, city park, and so yeah, just get out there and participate is the is is the thing there versus manipulate. It seems that the common uh, philosophy of humans, which you know, I'm painting kind of a negative picture here of today's culture or civilization, is that we manipulate the environment, not that we participate in it. Participation requires sensitivity. Uh, manipulation is dominance and it's it's not caring about the cost of constantly tilling up the soil um, and monocrops and you know, the kind of the detrimental things we're seeing so I just think I just think that word there participation there's a lot of power in that and we like you know to ensure that you're particip participating in like your relationships here you know I'm not just manipulating it uh, you know I see that happening all, all the time in dynamics of interpersonal relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, make sure you're participating in your yard. Make sure you're participating with your children. Your like participation is a is a is a word. I think there's a lot to be studied. There. I think yeah. there's a lot to be studied there and thought about. I, so agree. I just kind of want to throw that out there. Participation versus manipulation. Your yeah. idea of you want to go? <laughs> sure. If you don't mind, yeah. I just want to yeah. respond really quick. <laughs> um, I'm I'm gonna harken us back to Daniel Quinn. Um, one of the things in Ishmael that you should read Ishmael um, <laughs> is the idea that our species is bad or that uh, dark. And the truth of it is that as far as I know, that our species is not innately bad or dark. It's this particular aspect of our culture that has been taken away from nature and put into a place where we don't know how to participate correctly in nature anymore. So what we've been taught is you buy a piece of land, you clear out all the trees and you plant corn because our parents and our grandparents didn't know that if you leave the trees there, there's already food growing. Um, so I don't think that, I don't think our species is innately bad. I think that we've forgotten that our culture has forgotten how to participate in nature. So we've been taught to manipulate it, to overpower it and to control it, which to me is, is sort of the heart of rewilding is 
remembering that we are a part of nature. We are a part of the food chain and that we are meant to be here. And helping people get to a place where they can remember that. So, yeah, to piggyback off both these things, um, the idea of participation reminded me of dependence also. Um, and that we act we act upon the world and our lives as if we don't depend on nature, which we obviously, anyone, you know, would agree with that we, we obviously depend, our lives depend on a healthy, balanced ecosystem. But our system and our actions don't act in accord with that fact. So an example would be tap water or bottled water, which is a more extreme version of tap water. Um, if you ask intact indigenous cultures or intact um, hunter-gatherer cultures where they get their water from, they'll show you their nearest stream, spring, lake, you know, rain collection, things like that. They'll show you like their natural body of water. Um, but if you ask someone, if you ask a child, especially now, they'll say it comes from the tap, which requires, you know, it requires a, a large industrialized system to get it to your house with pressure behind it treated with chemicals that aren't always good for us, <laughs> things like that. And you can apply that to almost anything. It's called, um, one of my favorite authors calls it a toxic mimic. So it's basically something that our culture has created that mimics its original source, whether it be food, water, shelter, medicine, clothing, um, human connection. Facebook would be a toxic mimic for what we're doing here, for example. A chat room could be a toxic mimic for that. Um, so. The idea is that it's toxic because it it sort of alienates you from the original source of of what would keep you alive. And I think that because we are because we identify with agriculture and with tap water and with ref the food in our refrigerator and our grocery stores and stuff like that, we don't defend nature. We defend those things, whether it be physically defend or or even in an argument, you know, we would defend that our food comes from the grocery store. And if someone was going to come try to bulldoze the grocery store, people would show up at the protest and try to stop it, you know? <laughs> like, so that's, to me, um, what you were saying about participation is definitely key here because I think when people start to recognize that they actually depend on this instead of the grocery store for their food, then you're going to defend the thing that keeps you alive that's what all species do so um obviously there's there's a shift because people don't currently get all their food from the forest directly so um well you could argue that they do because they're in order to plant a farm you have to destroy an old growth forest plow the field plant the, the crops so technically it does come from what used to be a forest so ouch yeah <laughs> so so once you start recognizing where <coughs> the things that keep you alive come from, you will start to shift your allegiance towards nature instead of um, the mimics that we've sort of created. So participation or balanced participation um, is definitely a big part of rewilding. I, I, don't, I don't remember who said it, but I recently, somewhat recently, read uh, it's important to get people into nature outside of the... Um, take only photographs, leave only footprints idea, mm -hmm. because people are much more likely to protect something that they have a relationship with. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, this, my whole rewilding journey started because when I was a teenager, I saw bulldozers tearing down forests to build strip malls and it crushed me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have never understood why we can't just leave the world the way it is and figure out a way to live on it the way that it has evolved. You know, why are we so uncomfortable outside? Why are we so uncomfortable with the way things are meant to be? And, you know, Atreyu, one of my most painful moments as a parent, and this, this is for you, but it's also true. <laughs> About three months ago, my daughter, who is raised by several people, asked me for a glass of water. 
I grabbed a sink or a glass, I put it under the sink, turned on the faucet and handed it to her and she said, are you sure that's safe to drink? <laughs> <laughs> wow. So yeah, we, <clears throat> even we have our issues to work out. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a, that was a tough pill to swallow for sure. So I feel like we're all on board that this is a continuum or it's a spectrum. There is no goal here, right? There's no ultimate end. To me, I'd like to address that actually. Kay. I don't think that there is an ultimate end necessarily, but I do like to think that I guess I think of a continuum as a circle or, or a line that you can constantly move around on but it feels like I guess there to me there are ideals in it sort of to strive for um, at least in terms of sustainability because for example to me it's completely acceptable and encouraged to be someone on the far end of the spectrum where you are um, working the 9 to 5 in a skyscraper and you want maybe more you want your family to have more time in nature. That's super important. Because no matter where you are in the spectrum, that's, it matters if you're moving in the direction of rewilding. But if, if we sort of act as if that type of lifestyle, participating in, in industrialized agriculture is sustainable, then we're, there aren't gonna be any people <laughs> anymore <laughs> after, right. after a while. So you gotta like, that's, you gotta say there is yeah. something there. Yeah, yeah. Actually... and that's a whole nother video as to why it's not sustainable. <laughs> right. But the that... point, my, to me, if we're moving in a direction of rewilding, I guess when people move in a direction, it's because they have some sort of destination or at least journey in mind. And I, not that there needs to be a set destination, but that there at least needs to be a reason why we're moving away from domestication and towards wildness, which is what rewilding. The, the, the actual just word re-wild would mean moving away from something else. Yeah. So, but again, that's, an, that's another video. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I apologize for that. And thank you for saying that because that, I feel like I totally neglected that part of the whole thing. Um, another, th another thing that I completely forgot to bring up that's huge in the way that I convey information to the people in my world is I have have never asked and am not asking anyone to go back towards anything. You know, you get people who want to go back to be a cowboy or back to be a mountain man or back to the colonial or back to be a caveman. But going back isn't, it's not possible, it's not feasible. What we need to do is take what the ancestral knowledge that we have, combine it with the experience that we have going on right now and with those two things move forward to something better, to something more sustainable. Um, I'm sorry that I left that out. I feel like um, the the cool thing we do here at Rewild University is actually offer maybe some skills or ways of participating or maybe finding that motivation to take some of those steps. So, uh, I mean, Kenton, what do you, like what is something we like we can be doing because I feel like that's also part of this message. We don't just want to like just talk about it, you know. We actually want to maybe give people something to think about, to right. work on, uh, maybe very something, even something specific that's gonna, you know, just nudge them along just a little bit to um, to work towards. Because I mean, it's pretty important that we are on this trajectory of rewilding because of, I don't have to explain why. I right. mean, obviously, <laughs> yeah. it's pretty important over there. Yeah. So Kenton has offered me many chances to kind of find that within myself, and I've made huge leaps in the past year in regards to that. So, and we, that's what we do with the students. So we, it feels like we're all talking about motivation yeah. here. Like, so when we have rewilding out there, but why is somebody going to care? Why is somebody going to move towards it? And that's, there's so much momentum to stay on our, just keep, you know, doing the things we're doing and buying the new phones and buying the new cars and throwing stuff away. And so what is going to 
motivate and there can be fear tactics, there can be guilt that we can use. But I think rewilding has the potential to really motivate in a positive way because you make a dietary shift. So you cut sugar completely out of your diet. After a month or two, you're gonna feel the difference. And you just, you know, you guys probably know after people have been two, three months on a good diet out here, we take them back and they get some McDonald's or something and they get to feel what that does in their system, to their mind, to their body. After that, there's that motivation you felt for yourself. And so, whatever the shift is we're gonna make, I think rewilding just gives so many joyous benefits, mm -hmm. you know, that you can experience yourself. Mm -hmm. And as I look forward towards the future, in a way, I think that's the way we have to move. We could, everything might just fall apart. Anyway, we don't have any control over that. We could have a bloody revolution, and that's, we humans have done that so many times, it just repeats the cycle yeah. endlessly. But are we finally at the point in our history where we could have the wisdom to come together and say, okay, there is a better way. When you talk about moving forward, it's so important, I think, in this context of rewilding, that mm -hmm. we don't say, it's going back to living in caves because now we've lost almost everybody. Almost everybody. Right? And the only, <laughs> the only change that's going to happen is going to be through the revolution or the crash. But if we want to hope to change things through rewilding and being voices in rewilding, we have to motivate through inclusiveness. We have to motivate through positivity, I think. Yeah. And that's such a stronger motivator because once you make that dietary shift and you're like, oh, well, I feel great, you can tell your family about it, and, and it bleeds out. In the same way that the negativity can escalate, positivity can, can escalate and spread. And that's what I'd like, like to see. And again, I'm not on the forums, but I do hear talk of people on opposite sides kind of being at each other. And my message is kind of, if, if you're at each other, we need to. Yeah. <laughs> We need to rewild our minds. We need to start there because that's, that's step one in a way mm -hmm. is to find that place of, of balance inside of ourselves. Then we can move forward and see that, oh, okay, it's awesome that there's a person over here on this spectrum and a person over here on this spectrum. Yeah. That they can be appealing to different people. They can be having even different messages, but they can have respect communication, love with each other, and say, hey, we're working towards the same thing at all. I like what you're saying about um, <clears throat> about the motivators, sort of, because like Blake was saying, or I guess originally Peter Michael Bauer, um, that all subjects taken to their furthest point or their, their extreme lead to rewilding. So whether you're coming at, you know, this video because Maybe it showed up and maybe you were looking at like a paleo diet video and then this was in the related section or something. Or you were, awesome. yeah. <laughs> or, or, you were, or you were looking up, um, you know, traditional archery or you were looking up sustainable living practices or, I mean, it could, you know, uh, how, how hunter-gatherers used to move. Thing, you know, yeah, any kind of subject that you're passionate about that, that you... Are motivated to improve in this the re rewilding movement has a place for that because yeah. rewilding encompasses <laughs> every aspect of human existence yeah, to me it has to it has to because it, it's basically how to live in nature sort of you know yeah. so that would automatically encompass every facet of, of human existence so it's a it to me it automatically without discussion is inclusive it is inclusive at its base, you know, not saying that there aren't people out there who aren't being inclusive because that is a problem, but it ought to be perfectly inclusive because it's human rewilding and it encompasses every, you know, experience. Yeah. So inclusiveness needs to be, it's, just, it's inherent, so it needs to be, <laughs> people need to act as if it is inherent, which it is, you know? <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. the, the things that separate us, the ideas of, race, class, religion, you know, culture, none of that stuff existed until just a few thousand years ago. It was oh, all gosh. just 
people before that. People decided to plant wheat and then those things happened. Another video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just really want to give one more bit yeah. uh, related to maybe some specific practice or something too, because this is what I this is what I do for myself, and so maybe it works for others. Is um, body awareness type of thing. So you eat better, you feel the difference of whenever you do make, you know, you go get the little Caesar's pizza, and what that what that does to you after eating after eating you know clean for a couple months. Right. Um, so that's that's a body awareness practice. So that's where I really started my rewilding journey was diet and clean water. Yeah. And so, you know, you build a sensitivity to taste and to um, to the to that very direct function of what food is doing to you. But then there's other things like um, meditation. You know, we actually become sensitive to what's actually going on. You know, where are we? Are are we feeding kind of anxieties or or we can we catch ourselves and and um, you know redirect it a bit. So sensitivity practice of diet, maybe some meditation, and then movement. For me, ta like I need that tangibility myself. Personally, I'm a very physical person, so I practice tai chi or yoga or you know anything really. Just movement. Right. I try to really feel out like the mechanics of things, and that builds a sensitivity here. And if I, if I can be sensitive and with my body, then I can start expanding that boundary of my sensitivity. So I've become sensitive of my gut, um, become sensitive of my body, sensitive of my mind, and then uh, I can become sensitive to other people, you know, my like, proximity of things, not necessarily like just that, fitness, that physicalness, but sensitive to a trait you use, emotions, um, and then sensitive to, and then eventually this becomes sensitive to my environment and it's whole, you mm -hmm. know. You, but I start with what I can actually feel, like what is tangible, and that's this, this, this is body right here. So, um, yeah, sensitivity or centering, balancing practices, and I think that comes with, there's, there's a lot of resources out there for diet, and that's, that's got it, that's like a huge one, that's just, I mean, there's, you can be doing the, the movement or meditation and stuff, but like if you're eating lots of processed sugars and things, it's gonna make it pop, really difficult to actually catch your mind, mm -hmm. you know, going off on these tangents and, and stuff. So actually getting your mind in a centric place, getting your body there, um, so diet, and then like I said, movement. Um, just finding your awareness here. Find yourself here. Can you actually be here? Can you not be out there super goal oriented, you know, not present moment to moment awareness, um, be here and then start expanding that sensitivity outward. Mm -hmm. So body awareness. Yeah. Um, that recently nutrition has become huge for me. We're going to talk about that a lot in the upcoming future. Um, cold conditioning has also been huge. For oh me. yeah. I've never done Wim Hof, but we live in a place where at least half the year is cold. It doesn't make any sense to me to not teach yourself how to be comfortable in it. Mm -hmm. I take my dog for a walk at least twice a day in shorts and a t-shirt and sandals, regardless of the weather. Um, I used to do cold showers, but I don't anymore because they suck. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I just did one this morning. Yeah. It was awesome, yeah. wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I do I like you know trying to make or working towards making myself comfortable in the environment that we live in has to include cold conditioning seeking right. discomforts yeah seeking mm -hmm. discomforts mm -hmm. uh, what's the word purposefully doing that um, growing through discomfort there's a word for it I can't think of it. Mm -hmm. I think that's I think that's one of those things that, that actually will bring you like cold conditioning that that brings you into your body. Oh, Lay down yeah. in the snow yeah. with just your undies on and see barefoot see snow you. walks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some of that. Yeah, that's I mean, great. I saw you in that video, dude. That yeah, was barefoot snow walking. Yeah, that was that was a good day. I chose a. <laughs> I think it was ten degrees out that day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the body awareness thing is super important. I feel like our ancestors would have experienced. Mm -hmm micro pain 
if you even want to call it pain, micro pain constantly throughout the day just because they're working all the time. Moving. If you've ever worked with your hands on you know, using a hammer or if you've ever worked on a car or something, you're hurting yourself every once in a while. You know, you'll hit your thumb or you'll... Flint napping, friction flint napping. fire. Yeah, yeah, all sorts of things. Yeah. So like, those arms are everyone's right. going to be working with their hands. They're going to be walking around. They're going to be tripping over stuff. And I feel like in order to prevent bigger injuries, you're going to need body awareness. You know, you need to know where your feet are, where your body is and everything, which that sense, some people call it the seventh sense proprioception, which we have obviously in terms of like balance and knowing where we are in space, but it's definitely been dumbed down in our current culture. And I think that, um, that the, the feeling of like, once you become body aware and once you are experiencing, I guess it would be discomfort now, but once you start, when you're in your body to that degree, to the utmost extreme, like our ancestors were, you sort of just, you don't have to try to be mindful. You don't have to try to like push past thoughts or anything. You don't have to yeah. practice radical acceptance because you're like any other animal in the forest. You're just yeah. present. So that's mm -hmm. a huge. I think that's it. Right yeah. That's, uh, other animals just exist in this. Yeah. Concept. I mean, they they don't. You know, I, some animals may have some of these uh, emotional games or something like that. Sure. I don't know. But sure. I mean, in general, our idea is that animals kind of exist in a very physical realm. And I believe that our ancestors would have, I mean, not that they weren't capable of philosophy and, and greater pictures, because we know they were. Right. Um, but their base, where they were, was here, mm -hmm. you know, in their bodies. They had to be. They had to be sensitive to the environment. Yeah. Um, there was no other choice. The saber-toothed tiger might be right over there. Yeah. Right. You know, you don't, you don't want to be, you know, off thinking about tomorrow's journey and then some creature sneaks right. up on you or something, right? The awareness is, was necessary. I'm painting kind of an extreme, but I think that, that that it was just a comfortable place to be, too. It's not like you're like, oh, where's the saber tooth tiger? You know, no, it's just totally. I'm here. I'm relaxed. <laughs> yeah. The relax, uh, relaxation. You, yeah. you find in history that the more sedentary any culture becomes, the more you start to see things like what we categorize or accept as philosophy. You, th see, you see things like fine arts or philosophy popping up more and more and more sedentary cultures. Which is inaccurate in the sense that only civilized cultures have those things because indigenous cultures had philosophy, they had music, they had arts and everything. It's just that when you see a culture become more and more sedentary, you see things like the arts and philosophy being something that you can just do. You can just do that. Mm -hmm. Like, every time I hear about an ancient philosophy story, like, here's how Descartes came up with I think, therefore I am. He was sitting... That's always the thing. He was sitting by the fire in his pajamas <laughs> because he was able to his, he was able to afford that kind of lifestyle. He had his own house, his own fireplace, and he was able to sit and just think, and that was it. You know, he didn't have to, to do anything else. So yeah, it said, I think um, being sedentary and not body aware causes us to be in our heads more because we're not in our bodies. You know, mm -hmm. that's when you see that's when people come up with crazy ideas like planting wheat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. still pretty sure they started that to make beer. <laughs> Could be, yeah. Nobody knows. But <clears throat> all right. Yeah. <clears throat> so, what can we agree on? It's a spectrum. Harmonious. Harmonious. Um, inclusive. Inclusive. Participatory. Participatory. In. In your body, in the moment. Needs to be sustainable ecologically and um, psychologically. Yeah, I think you know, I've said it before, but this the sustainable part is how I got into this in the first place. That's how I got into it and why I'm still in it. It's my yeah. biggest motivator for sure. Yeah. There's a good quote to somewhat what you're saying is that um, our current sense of self is no more sustainable than our factory farms or our factories. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Derek Jensen. <laughs> of course it is. Yeah. Of course it is. I don't know. Does anyone else have anything they want to add? I feel I feel pretty pretty confident, pretty strong about <clears throat> um first of all, we've shown you why it's so difficult to define. <laughs> I feel pretty strong about that. And second of all, I feel like we've given people some really good tools to at least start with. Um, um, a lot of questions, I bet. Yes. <laughs> I know of at least four people that you can contact if you have any questions. 
if you found yeah. this video, you can probably figure out how to get in touch with us. Yeah. <clears throat> I think all of us, you know, we put the time into like answering people's questions too. Like it's, it's a great time for us to reflect on our own beliefs or ways we participate. And uh, of course it's spreading the love. Yeah. And I think all of us really feel that. I mean, I can get that feel from you that that's, you know, it's not like, it's not work. You know? Right. It's not work no. to, <laughs> to help others really. It's not yeah. Like, I like I like talking to people and responding to people's emails more than I like making videos and teaching classes. I think. <laughs> yeah. But even yeah, just I like for the discussion. Discussion. Yeah. even this where you know it's just some if you're just like confirming each other's ideas, you know, that's that's really it's a good feeling to know that there's someone else out there that, that see, has a similar place as you as yeah. in the mind and body. And, um, that's enough of a reason to reach out and say something. Just be like. Yeah, I agree. You know, and be like, yeah, I agree too. You yeah. Know, so. Yeah. Yep, I, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let's do this. Uh, thank you to all three of these guys for coming. Thank you for listening. Um, I, I hope you've enjoyed this, uh, if nothing else, but I really hope you've learned something from it. If you did learn anything and you have any questions, or if this is something you've thought about and you want to start a conversation please let us know we have several ways to get in touch with us obviously um if you've learned anything from this find someone to share it with hopefully we can spread this around get it to as many people as possible uh thank you very much i appreciate every second of your time and see you next time.